when, when, we, uh, when, when I started working in uh, Agile uh, for last, I think, uh, seven, around seven or eight, eight, eight years ago, then uh, most of the books or most of the material which we had uh, was around Agile, which was about the colloquial teams. But if you think about the services company or the, or the way th uh, things work in India, most of the work is offshore and uh, uh, what we need to do is working in a distributed agile. So as far as uh, the material is concerned, uh, there was very less material ab around it. So we had to struggle about it, like what, what we need to do when we start working in a distributed agile fashion. So basically what we started doing is we started expect experimenting and think and see like based on our common sense and uh, pragmatism, uh, pragmatism, how things work in distributed agile. And then we started evolving certain patterns. Uh, so this conversation or session is all about uh, those patterns or the practices which we generally face in, in our uh, way of working when we are working in, as a out, outsource vendor or, uh, or working with the multiple distributed teams. So, so this is a basically uh, the outcome of that experience. Yes. So basically the teams are sitting in the distributed location. Uh, it can be like entire team is distributed. That means uh, each and every member is in diff different location, different time zones. So that kind of stuff. But most of the common uh, way of working is that uh, your uh, customer is at uh, on-site location in, in US or somewhere and then you're working as a team over here. So Basically, we try to see like how, how Agile can work in that kind of situation and we evolve certain practices out of that. So as far as uh, me is concerned, uh, I am working as an Agile coach and director of engineering uh, at Global Logic Noida. I have around uh, 16 years experience. I train in Agile, Agile testing, continuous delivery, specification by example, continuous inspection. Uh, personally, I, my hobbies are uh, uh, singing, counseling, or self-help, help thinking. Uh, I'm available in the, on the Twitter. And uh, I write a lot of uh, blogs also on agilebuddha.com uh, where, based on experience, we write our stuff. So before we start talking about uh, what can be the different patterns, let's see like what, what are the failure points. So uh, because what, what I've seen is that uh, we started blaming the, the way of uh, distributed way of working, but actually the, there are basic problems in the way you are working right now. Fine. So, so first thing is that not actually doing basic Scrum in the first place. I mean, let let's forget about what what are the kind of problems you are facing in distributed agile or not. But you are not doing the basic Scrum in, uh, uh, at all. So, for example, there there is no retrospective. Uh, there are no planning meeting or you are not measuring the velocity uh, in the st story points. Uh, so basically, the f in the first place itself, if the scrum is not working, then it is very difficult to define if the distributed scrum is not working or scrum is not working. Second thing is that uh, inadequate tools and governance mechanism to make asynchronous communication successful. So uh, in my experience, what I've seen is uh, when you're working in distributed locations, then the communication is the most important thing. Uh, if you're not having a good amount of communication and communication channels, then basically uh, you will be facing a lot of problems. So uh, we, if there are no ad adequate tools or governance mechanism to, to make it happen, either a co-location or basically working uh, on, in the real, real time using video, uh, video conference and those kind of stuff, uh, that becomes very difficult. Then this is a also very, very important point, we versus they or vendor versus customer mindset. So even though you are working in a distributed fashion, uh, cus customer thinks as a customer and, uh, and, uh, and basically they term is a uh, vendor versus uh, customer mindset. Uh, again, uh, it's not like uh, it, ha it, it happens only with the customer or vendor, it is a kind of general human phenomena, when there is a lo lot of scope of, or gap in the communication, then you start forming the we versus they kind of culture. Then 
uh, unbalanced distribution of the work and ownership. So that also makes a lot of problems as far as distributed agile is concerned. So let's uh, move to the distributed agile success factors. So you may say that fine, they, these are the uh, failure, failure factors. So if you reverse them, then they, they, they can be success factors. But they, at, that is not so. I mean, there are more factors which I would like to touch base over here. So first and foremost thing is that I think the most, uh, many of us, yes, sure. Yeah, basically the different time zones uh, supporting is also, a it, it cannot be failure point. Uh, it, can, it, it can be termed as a challenge, I, I would say how you basically mitigate how to work in the different time zones. I, I'll be discussing that later, fine. So distribute agile success factors. I hope many of us are programmers over here and many of us have uh, read something about distributed programming. So one of the first principle in the distributed programming is don't distribute at all. Fine. So if you can avoid uh, the distributed way of working, that is the most, I mean, that is the first thing you want to consider. Because as soon as you start thinking about distribution, then basically it comes with a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, problems or not problems, the challenges and, uh, uh, and basically the ROI which will be, you will be getting later, uh, it takes a little time to get that. So, until, so be, first, of, first of, uh, and foremost, before you consider any other thing, make, try to see like if you can avoid distribution at all or not, fine? Then the, this is the also important thing that uh, when you're working in, a, uh, in an environment uh, of distribution, then trust takes a, uh, takes a toss. Uh, and and uh, and because of many reasons, uh, because of the communication gaps. So for example, like, let's, like, let's, let me take an example. So uh, two developers are working in, in, in one location, in, one is working in Netherlands, and one is another is working in, the, uh, in India. So now what happens, what happens is that uh, uh, this guy wants to talk to that person, but uh, the other guy on the Netherlands end uh, is not able to take, take this, that, those messages because he wants to focus on the work. And he was, he's not able to see the messages coming from the Skype, for example. So in that case, the other person thinks, okay, this guy, this guy is start, starting avoiding me or he's, he doesn't want to talk to me. So basically these kind of communication gaps starts making some kind of problems and, and having the trust problem. And there are other factors also from the vendor V versus they factors and those, those things that also create a trust deficit. So trust is a very, very important thing if you want to really work in a distributed fashion. Courage to change. Uh, and I think uh, this is one of the important thing which based on my experience because uh, our, uh, our, uh, our projects really worked because we thought, okay, this thing is not working. Let's try to see like what, what are the other options. And uh, let's try to implement in t by tomorrow or, or by the next sprint and see how it works. If it doesn't work, then we'll, we can change it further. But uh, in many projects I have seen that there is a lot of resistance to change. Uh, I mean, even though they, find, they feel that, for example, like there is a product owner at the, at the uh, on-site and he's not able to devote the time, but this, they keep on cribbing, then basically uh, they don't do, do anything about that, that problem, and, bust, and, and then sit on the problems. So instead of, th instead of sitting on the problem, it is very, very important that you think what can be done in this kind of situation. And uh, many of the things which, I, which I'll be discussing later are based on our experiments, based on the, the kind of situations we face, and we try to make changes on, to, on top of that. Fine? And, uh, when you have the courage to change, then that brings to the innovation. So, for example, we started doing the distributed pair programming just because 
we were distributed in, in multiple continents, and we, we thought that knowledge exchange is very important. Uh, we were able to do the paper programming locally, but then we started thinking, let's do the remote paper programming at, at the time, and we started doing it. Uh, we started doing it even when, like for example, somebody is working from home, then that guy can also still work at, in a distributed paper programming fashion. So basically, when you see the need and you want to you want to make the change, and then you then gives uh, the I mean you find some new ways to do the same thing. Uh, I do, I cannot uh, stress more and more about the communication. Communication is the biggest effect, one of the biggest factor why uh, distributed agile projects may fail, because because of the communication problems and because of the human touch. Uh, uh, you start losing the trust in the, in, the t in the other people, and that starts creating the problems. So to avoid that, uh, what I've done is, yeah, sure. So, the, the, I mean, uh, because we are distributed, uh, what I've seen is that uh, there is no one way of doing the communication. There are many ways to ma make sure that the bridge of the two humans is bridged somehow. So it's, it's, communication is what? Like I, I want to feel you as a person in front of me instead of somebody is there who is, who is doing some kind of typing. I, I mean, that human touch is very important. So what we, I mean, first thing we, we did was like uh, having some kind of collocation. Uh, so pe people from the on-site keep on coming over here, or we keep on going over there. So that way, basically, the human touch keep, keep, uh, keep on there. And then, basically, uh, what we also did uh, was to doing kind of uh, video, pair, uh, video conversation or uh, distributed pair programming, so that those things. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, I, what I've seen is that co-location is important after two or three months because what, I, what, what, what happens is like, for example, you, uh, you come to your own site in, in India and you feel very one team and uh, you can really uh, see them, uh, I mean, touch, uh, touch the, with the other, other people in India. But what happens is, is that as you move to the distributed location after two or three months, that emotional gap starts bridging up. I mean, it, it is a no, no, normal human tendency. And then again, that person remains yet another entity. So human touch is very important. So whatever way you can bridge that communication gap or, or bridge that human touch, that, I mean, there are many ways to do it. Fine. So what I've done is that uh, I have structured uh, this, these patterns into two, two forms. One is structural patterns and another is implementation patterns. Structural patterns is like, uh, okay, this is a kind of situation we have. In this situation, how should we structure our team and uh, what are the pros and cons on doing that? Fine, this is the way, uh, this is the kind of structural way of uh, doing things. But then basically implementation is like, uh, for example, uh, now we are in, in, a, in, uh, in a situation where there are multi, uh, two time zones. We are working with the US team over there and here, India team. Then in this kind of situation, what are the things which, which we can do to keep our, ourselves better? So there are two, two things. So, so I would like to touch base both, both of the, those things over here. So these are structural patterns. Uh, so local control distributed team. Uh, so local control means that the product owner and the scrum master is uh, on the on-site. There is uh, some team uh, uh, in, in, uh, in the distributed location as well. And then there are certain people in India. Uh, this situation happens when, for example, like you have, uh, I mean, you, st you, st do, you started doing the startup, for example. You have certain front-end developers, and uh, now you, what you want to do is you want to basically extend your team and with India and want to have some back-end developers, fine? So that can, this is the kind of situation where you want to have more people, more people in your team, fine? So, so in this case, uh, this is most useful when team size is small, for example, a team of uh, four to eight, 
person scrum team. Team members are peers, little or no mentorship required. So this is a very big problem. So the trust deficit starts happening. For example, like there is, there is a team in US who are having around 20 years experience. And then in India, you start having a, a team of two years experience. And then all the time, these, those people are teaching that team. Then I mean, they'll, they'll, they will not be, uh, there will be a huge trust deficit and uh, that, that thing is not going to work. It is very, very important when you start working in this kind of fashion that natural overlap of five to four, four to five core hours should be there in, in the time zones, right? So it can happen, for example, if you're working with, uh, with Australia or you're working with, uh, for example, Europe, then you can do that. But if you you're start working in an extreme time zone, it is not, it's not going to work. Make sense? Because when you're working in this kind of fashion, then basically you have to exchange the knowledge all the time. And that cannot happen if you don't have the core hours. Fine? I'm, I'm not saying uh, it should be, it should happen like this. I'm, these are the situations which happen in the real time. For example, I started building a startup in US, fine. I have four developers with me who are all front-end developers. I need back-end developers and I want, uh, I, I want to have some, uh, I, I want to outsource that in India, for example, fine. So in that case, I, uh, I talked to a company which gives me four, four back-end developers and they started working with me. I gave the wrong example in US, I should say in, in Europe, for example. In Europe, it works. So that way, you have a scrum team which is working together to, to build one product. Yes. And, uh... yes, yes, you have, you'll, have, you'll be having all the meetings in, in a distributed fashion using, using Skype and screen share, uh, and people do that. Yes. Uh, I mean, depends, like whether the customer, uh, customer is a product owner and he has to be there for answering the questions and stuff like that, then he will be there. Sorry? Yeah. I have a point here. Yeah. It, it will be a... Yeah, basically, uh, I would say that uh, I will be coming to that. Uh, that there will be a, there, there is a pattern for that as well. Fine. I have a point. Though yeah. we have a uh, distributed team, we can uh, work in such a way, saying the number of features, if that can be uh, split up, so that the the for example, India and US, India can own up few features, which they can run and they can own and they can take it up. That will be a very good thing for the Scrum teams. Uh, I think you're, you, are, you, you have a point, a very good point, but the thing is that in this situation, uh, India team as a whole cannot work on their uh, features because they are the backend people. Front-end people on the US side cannot work on end-to-end -end feature because they are the front-end people, so that is a kind of uh, real situation. So I'll come to that, your point. I mean, you have a point, but uh, that is also covered over there. You can say that there, there, can, be, there can be some kind of local facilitator uh, in, in India. Yes, daily stand-up, daily, uh, uh, I mean, planning, demo, whatever you call, any, everything. Okay, so let's uh, uh, move on. Uh, so then the, the other thing is that continuous communication ch channel open all the time between the team members, so that means you will be having a situation where people have the headset, uh, they have the laptop, uh, and they, they can do the video communication, there is a very good bandwidth and stuff like that. So, so basically you have a good communication mechanism to be in touch all the time. Fine. Good tool support and uh, 
frequent face-to-face -face, uh, contact between team members to maintain team identity. So if you, if you are working as one team, I mean, one team means one team, and you want, you want to make sure that they, uh, there is a good amount of trust within, between the team, then uh, it is important that there is a kind of co-location. Uh, some team members frequently go to other side and that kind of, uh, every three or four months. So that way it, it really works. Fine. So problems to watch out for. So one is uh, non-peer uh, developers or too large a team. So in case uh, there is a huge amount of difference in terms of experience, then it's not going to work. There will be trust deficit by, by default and it's, going to, it's not going to work. Limited face-to-face -face communication. Uh, and because of that, like remote team starts feeling uh, detached uh, from the way they are working. Limited natural overlap in working hours. Uh, and bec uh, because of that, team members will get burned out un unless they start moving their working hours. Fine. Sorry. So lack of good real-time tools as, and synchronous um, uh, communication tools, I've, I've already discussed that. Then this is the next, uh, next, next pattern, which is remote functionality. Uh, and uh, basically, in in this uh, in this context also, actually th in the, in the earlier one, uh, it was a kind of uh, uh, it was a kind of situation where uh, they have uh, they had uh, uh, the I mean they 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 had both of the uh, both of the people like uh, developers and testers as well, but this is a situ situation where there, there is a, uh, I mean, there are people who have uh, functional knowledge uh, in some some area and functional knowledge in other area, uh, and that that they are they are working together. So, in order to make it work, uh, it is very important that uh, the, there is a strong functional expertise and ownership in the remote geography. So it should not like uh, they are not doing their, their own work and uh, remote team, I mean on-site team has to teach them how they're going to work. Uh, then disciplined scrum implementation with artifacts available. So if, in case, for example, you have a testing team in India and, uh, and development team, team in the US, then it is very important that uh, the kind of uh, com communication or uh, artifacts available globally, they, they are available in real time. So, Otherwise, if there is a lot of communication to and fro is happening, then this will create a problem. Uh, problems to watch out for: remote team members cannot attend full kickoff uh, uh, retrospective and team meetings. I mean, uh, it's not going to work if you have the ceremonies, but but basically all the whole team is not attending that. Uh, and th that creates a problem because, for example, like I have a feature, I want to estimate it, and uh, for estimating, I want to make sure that uh, there is a there, there is a feedback coming from the developers as well as from the testers because both of these people will be having some kind of understanding about the, that feature, and based on that, you can estimate it. So if uh, if people like uh, uh, people, people start estimating like this is dev estimate and this is the uh, my test test testing estimate. That st starts creating the problems. First of all, it creates the problem the we versus they. Plus, second thing is that uh, when both of these people sit together, then they give the feed, uh, inputs to each other, which is very important for the feature implementation. So, so it is very important that both these groups sit together and participate in the ceremonies. Any question on that?
So what we did, what what we did was we were having a local stand up in the morning for our team, and then we had a distributed distributed stand up uh, with the with the common team, uh, so that for example there are certain things which we want to, uh, I mean communicate to that team or they want to communicate to us. They can they can that can happen. But our day used to start in the in the early morning. So first of all is, uh, I mean, uh, as far as stand-up is concerned, it should be maximum 15 minutes, whatever it, it happens. So in the stand-up, what you're talking about is like, uh, this is where I am, and, and uh, I'm stuck over here, I need more information. I need information from you, can you help me after the stand-up, please? So you take that step from yes. Yes, yes. I mean, stand-up is just for the update and for the synchronization. And then after that, whatever things needs, requires a discussion, you take it offline. Uh, uh, I will be telling you uh, the, one of the pattern in the, in, in, in the later cases, like what we had was a kind, we, we created a kind of common time window in both of, the, both of the locations, in US as well as in India. So for example, in the evening, we had uh, six to eight, uh, uh, we had a two hours com common window in that no one can do the local meetings. I mean, for example, US people cannot have their own local meetings over there. That time is devoted for the whole, for the distributed team. Similarly here as well. So in case you need to communicate with any person, he, he will be available every day. If you don't do that, then basically you'll be having problems with this guy is not available because he's not there and that kind of stuff. Make sense? So as I said, like remote team will be missing the context and the fail behind the onshore. Then this is uh, the pattern which I generally like and which one, of, which one of the lady here mentioned also, is that if you, if you, do, if you, uh, if the, if you can have the feature teams which, which can work independently, fine. Why do, why, why, why at all you need the distribution? It happens. Many times people create a distributed teams just for the heck of it. Because we have certain people in US, because we have a certain people in India, let's have the distributed way of communication and stuff like that. Many times I've seen that that is not really required. You have certain people over there, you, you, you do the feature development over there. We, we can have our own feature team which, which will be developing the features over here. They can touch base on the integration points and that, that will work. You can avoid all the poor problems which comes with because of the distributed communication. You don't, you can avoid working in the late nights and stuff like that. Make sense? So this can happen when there is loose coupling in the features. If what happens is the one bug, if you have a one bug and that really causes problems in the other feature and there is a tight coupling, then it, I mean, it is not going to work. Make sense? If you need to have a lot of communication to and fro, then again it's not going to work. But many times I've seen that it works. By def default, people create distributed teams because we, had, we have certain people over there and over here. So we need to really see whether we really need distributed teams or not. Fine? Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Yes, yeah, to, to, uh, I mean, they, they are the uh, feature, independent feature teams. They have the autonomy to, to develop uh, their, uh, I mean, they, there can be product owner uh, over here who can define basically what needs to be done. But as far as implementation is concerned, that can be done independently by the feature team. Okay?
see the thing is that you will be, I mean, when, by definition, when you, whenever you work in the multiple teams, you definitely define a kind of release planning. This is how we are going to work together, multiple teams, fine? Then we will be, we will be creating the integration points so that you can work. And we will be integrating at this time. So basically that, I mean, apart from working independently, it is important to have a kind of governance on top of that. Make sense? So that whatever, whatever planning is happening, is happening uh, end to end, it's not like this guy is working in, in one island, another guy is work, working in isle, another island, when they start integrating, integrating after six months, then nothing works. Fine? So you have, that these teams have to make sure that end to end integration really happens uh, I mean, frequently. Make sense? So they can, they can work on verti one vertical slice uh, 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 out of the, I mean, part of it is developed by one team, another part is developed by another team, but they have to integrate in one sprint, for example. If that integration is not happening, this creates a big, big troubles because people feel very happy in working in isolation in, uh, in their own island, and when they start integrating after three months, I have seen people uh, struggling for months just to integrate stuff. Yeah. See, the continuous integration is, uh, there, there are two parts of so continuous integration. One is uh, continuous integration within your team. Fine? So basically, whenever you, you push the code into, into, the, in, into Git repository, you start building, compiling, running the test cases for your component, and everything works fine, very, very good. But who cares about the end-to-end -end integration? See, see, the, uh, I, I, one of the point which Naresh made yesterday is workflow test. Fine. One is like you are doing your own component test, which works fine. And in case there is a trouble in some uh, co another code base, it will break and you will find it. But what I'm tr trying to say is that at the end of the day, product owner needs a end-to-end -end functionality working. He doesn't care that your component is working. So it is very important that that vertical slice where one team component, another team component works together and that integration happens in a continuous integration environment. Make sense? So that is very important. That's where people, people don't care on, uh, I mean, people don't care and that then they find a lot of troubles because of that. See, the, the whole governance model is, is just because of that. It, I mean, that's where I said b beforehand that you need courage to take some certain steps. So, I mean, uh, I, I will tell you an example. So I was working in a team where uh, there was, uh, I mean, there was one team which was for creating the, the backbone of the whole entire architecture, and then there, there is one focus team on the, working on the front end, for example. So now what happened, that we, we had the same situation which you, which you mentioned. Then we made a decision, okay, we, we are, we are all, already done with this kind of stuff, uh, backbone, and this is where we are. So let's divide the team. Let's move these three people to the front end team and start working. Right? So you have to take decisions based on what is happening right now instead of just Okay, this is a team which is there and it will continue to be there forever. Make sense? So uh, with that, I, I let me move to the uh, implementation patterns. And uh, implementation patterns for uh, multiple things. So there are distributed teams on two locations. Distributed on, uh, teams on two locations with opposite time zones, fine. And third one is fully distributed teams. Fully distributed teams means uh, you have people. Uh, I mean, every, each and every individual is working from their home in different time zones, seven to eight time zones, and how it works. 
then uh, distribute teams on multiple location. So in this discussion, I will be focusing on the, the first two. Uh, I can touch base on other, other two as, as well, but I don't have time to focus on those two. So uh, let's, let's start thinking about distribute team on, uh, on the two locations, fine? This is, this is how it looks like. So you have some people working in the, in the UK, then there is some people working in the India, then this is how it really, really, really looks like. So uh, India team starts working from nine o'clock in the morning. They, uh, they basically uh, do the local standup in, in, at nine o'clock. Then after that, they do start doing, developing their code, coding new functionality. Then for example, 12 o'clock, there is a uh, distribute standup in which in case there are troubles, then we find out, okay, I need to touch base with this person or that person. We need to do the distribute pair programming with that, that guy or that guy. So that kind of decisions takes place. And uh, then other things can also happen over there in this time, uh, in, in this core hours. I'm talking about the uh, yellow stuff, yellow, yellow time. That is the core hours where these people work together, okay? And in that, you can have all the things, distributed demos, distributed uh, planning, whatever you name it. And then what happens is at the six o'clock in the evening, uh, India team commit, commits and basically uh, they continue, uh, in, uh, I mean, UK team continues and then again they commit at, at their end of the day. So this is how it works. So now uh, let me see like, uh, I mean, on top of the way you work in Agile, what else is, can be important, okay? So remote pairing I have seen is, is very, very important. Uh, we, we started doing the distributed pairing uh, and it gives a very good results. Uh, so basically, uh, there are tools available with which you can switch. So right now I am working for 30 minutes, for example. Uh, I'm finished with my test case and, and the work. I commit it. The other guy starts working from there and they, they continue in, in the pairing hours. So good thing I like about, this, uh, about the remote pairing is that you don't need to, uh, I mean, you, you are very comfortable on your machine, fine. You don't need to sit like this or that. So you, you are in a very comfortable position and uh, the communication, all, I mean, you need to communicate, you, you have to speak. So in case, I mean, one of the important thing about the peer programming is the communication. If you're not doing the communication with your peer, then basically uh, it, it will not work. In the, in the pay, uh, remote pairing, you have to communicate because that, that's the only way to make sure that other person is, is listening or working. Make sense? So, I have seen remote pairing working very well and we started doing that when people were working, uh, working from their home and, uh, and we, we paired from there as, as well. So any questions on that? So basically, the, uh, this is a, uh, this is a picture I have taken from somewhere. But uh, uh, but personally, what we do is we use uh, Skype screen share, or uh, there are other tools. Uh, 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 there are other tools available as as well. So for example, screen for the screen share, uh, there is join dot me. You can, you can do the screen share with that, and with the Skype, you can do the uh, voice communication. And and what is their feeling of satisfaction or dissatisfaction with the remote pairing? I, I have seen that it, it gives a good amount of dividends. I, I feel that uh, after working for two hours, you feel exhausted because you are so focused you are, and you are so productive out of working, working on that. So any other question on that? Do people feel happier to do remote pairing or do they feel happier to do, oh, leave me alone, I don't want to do remote pairing, I'd rather work alone? Uh, I've seen, uh, uh, I mean, it's a mixed thing. Like, uh, pe uh, people feel happier because they can focus a lot. Uh, they can, I mean, think about it like I can sit on my machine. I can see what is happening instead of working like this. 
So, com so you can sit comfortably and work comfortably uh, and uh, you can listen properly. So uh, earlier there was a problem like we had lower bandwidth and uh, video communication was not working well. There was a lot of gaps in, I mean, you type and something is not coming. Now it's real time all the time. So, so I've seen pe pe uh, teams working in that, this fashion only. I'm talking about the teams like, for example, who are working uh, across the geographies and uh, every team member is working from home. So this is a, this is a kind of uh, pattern is, is called virtual collocation. So as I, as I mentioned, like uh, I want to have a one team feeling. I want to have a uh, feeling that somebody is over there and somebody is over here as well. It's not like I'm looking at this person or looking at that person. It's more to make sure that we are feeling as one team. So, uh, so this is a Skype camera over there and that camera can see what these people, uh, who, what, who are the, at that, this particular moment. So it happens many times that I want to talk to that person, but uh, the, his Skype sh uh, uh, status show that it is green, but, but uh, originally that guy is not available. He has gone for the coffee. So then I think that this guy is not answering my message. Something is wrong. So that happens a lot. Or, uh, uh, or basically you send a Skype message, he's not answering because he's focused on his work and he's not able to see the Skype messages. With this kind of mechanism, you can see what people are doing, who are available. So in case of, uh, that, this, that guy is not available, you can ask other person to, to inform other, that person. And that's how it works. OK? Local retrospective. This we felt very important when we started working with the, uh, as a vendor. Uh, with a customer and we were working in an augmented team. Augmented team means like we were, there were some developers uh, in, Nether uh, in Netherlands, for example, and we were some developers working from India. So then the problem is that when you have a distributed uh, retrospective, then you cannot mention the local problem to the customer. It's very difficult, like, uh, 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 so something, I mean, our infrastructure is not working. So I cannot mention that in the distributed retrospective because of obvious reasons. Or I have some problems with my team members over here. I cannot mention that in the distributed retrospective. So we were feeling that those kind of forces in our teams and we were not sure how to handle that because we were not having any kind of local retrospective. So what we started doing was uh, to focus only on the local problems, we started doing the local retrospective. And that paid a lot, huge dividends. So for example, like, uh, if you think about this uh, uh, distributed teams, it's a kind of uh, only way to see how, uh, for, a, for a customer, only way to see how the team is doing is through the, for example, uh, distributed standard, for example. And think about a situation where the, <laughs> the, there is a person uh, who is a very introvert, He's no, he doesn't speak much, and there is one person who speaks a lot, fine? So in that situation, what happens is, uh, uh, though he, this guy works a lot, but he's not able to speak. And similarly, that, the, the, that person who is very extrovert is not a, uh, is not, doesn't work, but he's able to speak a very good things in front of the customer. So that situation happened in our, in our project as well, but we were not able to discuss in the distrib distributed retrospective. So then we started doing, uh, having a local focus and we resolve those problems locally. So that is very important, I feel, I feel if, you have, if you're working in a, this kind of mode. Then pseudo product owner and specs by example. Specification by example, I think people have heard in, in the last two days a lot. So this is a situation which is a very real situation. I mean, uh, it happens to many of us over here that the product owner, uh, owner is not available. He is very busy man. Uh, I am asking a question. He is taking three days to answer the question. And what happens because of that? The cycle time to to really uh, understand the story takes 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 this much instead of this much, and it it impacts uh, indirectly on my productivity. It looks like I am taking seven days to finish this story, 
But originally, I'm stuck because I've, I'm getting to and fro answers and it is taking a lot of time. And it happens many, in many teams. So one, uh, one idea is that, okay, fine, uh, we cannot do anything, let's script and do nothing about it. So that is one situation where you just say, okay, Proton is not working well and uh, we cannot do much about this. Another situation is let's do something about it. And this is, this is another situation that let's do something about this. So what we did, so here the QA or a business analyst moves to the on site. And basic, basically he interacts with the product owner. He doesn't replace the pro, uh, product owner, but he makes sure that whatever answers you need to have for, for the onshore, offshore team, you get, you're getting it uh, from there. Make sense? So, so basically uh, this QA guy can, or a business analyst guy can interact with the product owner in their whole day, but we just have very limited time, time window in which he's available or he's not available and then we're gone. So, so basically this guy sits over there and then makes sure that the, the information is communicated to, to the team in India, in India. So this works very well, but now what I'm adding on top of that is, I'm adding specs by example. So what this guy does is, apart from making sure that we understand the story properly, this guy, what this guy does is, he creates the acceptance criteria in specification by example, in an in ex executable spec. Make sense? So now he creates a user story based on a discussion with the, with the team and creates this uh, executable spec. Then the team has to implement those executable spec to make sure definition of done is there. So if those uh, acceptance criteria are met by, by your coding, then your story is done. So there is no communication gap anymore. Make sense? Any questions on that? So this is how a acceptance criteria looks like. So, so basically we talk about uh, uh, acceptance criteria, but we are, we, we, I, think, uh, I think we need to understand what specification by example is all about. You have specs, but with examples you get more clarity. Fine, I say something to you, this is the acceptance criteria, and, and then you say, give me example. So this is where the example fits in over there. So when I say that customer who buys two albums get one, an album free, so I'm giving an example, one album, no. Two album, yes. This is a very simple example, but it can be difficult examples, a complex example as well. But the idea is same. So based on that, you this guy creates the acceptance test cases, executable spec, and the team executes them. Okay. So then this is a uh, this is more like a governance model, uh, not bold pattern, and uh, this we felt and and. We thought that uh, there is a lot of uh, technical uh, communication which is happening through the different um, uh, different ceremonies like stand up and whatever. But they are all, all technical. I mean, it's all about like uh, what what did you do? And there are some problems I'm facing. Let's pair pair up. It's more, I mean, about the project and development stuff. But what is happening in the team? How, what is it? What is the trust factor over there? Is there something? Is there some some problem is coming? from the, the, this end or that, that, that end, that kind of discussion never happens about the humans, fine? So that's where we thought like the, the scrum master over there and local scrum master over, over here, they just have a chit, chit chat. How things are going? How, how is scrum, is sprint is moving? Are you facing any problems? How is team, how is team feeling right now? Those kind of questions. So they are not technical. They are more about the how how team is working together. Fine. If you have this kind of communication, it has nothing to do with the Scrum. It is no. It is a human interaction, and that is that gave a lot of dividend to us because we we could find the problems or some kind of mistrust which is which is which was happening earlier before it could come to us, and then we could do something about this. Okay. Then. This is a very, very important thing uh, I would like to mention over here. Whoever is working in the distributed fashion right now, 
they have to understand the importance of the backlog grooming and the definition of ready. If they don't understand, then, I mean, I have seen that at least 60 to 70 pe percent people have problems because of this. And the idea, I, just to make sure that everybody understands what the definition of ready is all about, if, I mean, customer wants a done product, everybody, I mean, everybody knows about it, isn't it? And there is a definition of done that compilation should be there, unit test cases are there, and things like that, so many things are there. But as a team member, I also want to make sure that give me the ready use story. Doesn't it make sense? And ready means what? Ready means, as a team, we have no outstanding questions that stop us from working on this, be it test, dev, or whatever. So that means we really understand what the, what the use story is all about. There is no third party dependency uh, which can stop us when, when we are working on that. There is no unanswered questions we can, which can stop us because, because of those unanswered questions only, there is a lot of to and fro in the distributed way of working. Isn't it? So I, I mean, I started working in a user story and then I found I don't know about what, what should happen in this kind of situation. And then I ask the product owner, and product owner takes two, two days to answer. So think about it. Like, your cycle time has increased to, to one day to, to three days. Isn't it? So what you need to do is, you need to do the backlog grooming behind the scene. You have to make sure that only ready user stories are considered for the sprint planning. If the user stories are not ready, do not take in them into the sprint planning. So to make the user story ready, you need to do the backlog grooming. And that happens before sprint planning really starts. Make sense? Yeah, so that's, that's where I'm coming here. So this is, a, this is a kind of roadmap of the next three iterations. So this is a Kanban board for the product owner. He, he can say that, fine, uh, in the iteration plus three, these are the kind of cards I want to see. And that, that may change, basically, depending on the prioritization. Fine? So, I, and in the iteration plus two, this is how, what, these, these are the stories I want, these are the stories I want in this iteration, iteration plus, plus one. But as you move from the left to right, left to right, yeah, left to right, then the cl clarity on the user stories much, becomes much, much clearer. Here, I just know that this user story will be there, but I don't know the clarity. Now, as you move forward in the backlog grooming, then the clarity becomes increasing and increasing. But important point is, until and unless there is a card in the ready to play column, you cannot consider that as part of the planning. Make sense? Even though this car is iteration plus one, it's not ready. Why in that? Then I cannot consider it as, as part of this planning meeting. Make sense? So you have a roadmap that these are the cards which are coming and we can focus and groom these, these cards in this fashion. So, so that should be visible to the team and they should, this, this board should be there with the product owner. So the thing is that as soon as you feel that enough information is there on that card, estimate it then and there, that's it finished. It's ready. Why do you need to, do, uh, to pick that card again if that is discussed already in the backlog grooming and it's ready? If you have enough information about that card, make it ready, estimate it, move it to the ready to play column, and that's it. And you focus on the ready to play uh, cards only in the sprint planning. Make sure that Proton understands that. Okay? So this is uh, another one. Uh, one team, uh, sorry, this is, uh, I have written it wrong. It should be one team, multiple project, pro projects. This pattern works uh, when 
For example, you have a team of uh, five people working in a, in a uh, maintenance way of working. Sometimes you have a lot of work, sometimes you don't. Sometimes this team, uh, this, this guy is having a lot of work, sometimes not. So what do you do in that, that kind of situation? So what we did was, we started doing the pairing session between these team, uh, team members, make them cross-skilled. So when the, the crunch situation comes into, into, uh, into the another project, then that, that particular guy can support it. And now customer can also decide the priority based, not based on the person available, but based on the business need. Okay? So skill set means like uh, uh, there is one project uh, which is in sub technology, I mean similar kind of technology stack. I mean, if it is a, comp uh, it, it is a similar skill set. It's not, it's not like this, this guy is working in .NET, this guy is working in Java. Only thing is, this guy, is do, two guys are working in Java, but they are working in different frameworks, so that this guy can learn new framework. And this guy can also learn domain knowledge based on the pairing experience. So I'm not saying that this is going to work from the day one, but based on the pairing session with the other guy, you will learn you will get the, gain the new skill and you can apply that when the current situation comes. So this is about uh, distributed co-located teams in opposite time zones, fine? So let's see how it's going to work. So first and more foremost important thing is that uh, in order to make it work, they need to have uh, um, they need to have work, work as a one team, which means shared vision, communication, shared ownership, shared goals, active participation. So, so that so they should really work and consider as one team, and not this is offshore team, this is off, uh, onshore team. They should have one Git repository to work together. They should work on. On, on the user story they need to work on. So, so, that, so, so first important thing is to that make sure that they are working as one team. Second thing is create overlap. So, so what we did in our case is like we, start, uh, we started creating an overlap where, for example, US team come a little early and we, st we start a little late. Instead of com coming in office at nine, we started coming at 11. And then we had a overlap of two hours or three hours, fine? In these, four, in these two or three hours, there is no local meetings in the overlap, in, in overlap hours, as I mentioned before. So if I need to talk to that, uh, a person in the outside, that guy will be available because he's not doing any local meeting over there. Make sense? Scrum meetings attended by the whole team. Otherwise, not going to work. Yeah. So all the scrum meetings? Yes. Continuous backlog grooming. I think this is taken from the previous one also, but I think I'm just trying to make sure that we understand what backlog grooming means. Uh, in the, as, as a epic comes, it comes as a rock. And then you start drilling down it and slice, 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 slice. As it moves to the sprint, it is smaller user stories. So this is how, this is a kind of uh, backlog grooming iceberg. So as it moves, up, then it becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. So backlog grooming is, is a very, very important thing uh, in order to work in the distributed fashion uh, in, in, the, in the opposite time zones also, uh, as well. But I think the most important factor is 
this. But at the same time, it should not be like uh, local team is also coming uh, at 9 o'clock, but they are staying at 9 o'clock in the evening as well. Then it is not going to work. I mean, the US team has to come early, this team can, has to start late, then it's kind of, it can work. Can you give me a taste of the time overlaps that this team did? So 12 hours, 12, 12, 12, 12 five hours. Meaning, uh, what time did the team come in? Did they stay, did they start in the morning or did they start late? And so for time? example, we started late in, at 11 o'clock. 11 a.m., okay. 11 a.m. And then we stayed a little late in the evening. Oh, okay. Uh, and then the U.S. team come in a little early. Wait, uh, what time about? Uh, around 8. Okay. Something cool. Like Thanks. So ba basically both of the te these teams have to make some comp compromise to make it work. Otherwise, it's not like just one team has to sacrifice everything. So that's all about it. Uh, and uh, any questions? Though I have other things as well, uh, but that, that will take a lot of time. So any questions? Any questions on any distributed stuff? Yeah. Hello? So, uh, yeah. Sorry, uh, did you, how did you, was it hard to negotiate like the, the, the and discipline that people can work together and how did that overlap? Uh, can you say it again? Was it challenging to get people to agree to work in an overlap time frame for the two different teams to one team to come in early, one team to come in late? Was I, it I think uh, one of the things I want to mention here is, uh, I, I don't, this is, a, this is a team norms, which I, I want to mention here. Irrespective of whatever team you're working, whether it's a local, distributed, or whatever, make, sense, make sure that when you start, when you start forming the team, you, you basically create some set of norms within the team so that, that, so that you know this is how we are going to work together. Norms means that this is the way best, I mean this is the best way I want to work in a team and these are the values I really, really, really care about. If that doesn't happen, that, that will be difficult for me to work in a team. So basically you define those norms beforehand at the beginning of the project and everybody is aware about it. If somebody violates, then you come to know, I mean, the person can say, oh, you have violated this norm, why, I mean, what's the problem? So in order to create a team, it's, I think I've, it is very, very important to have some, some kind of team norms, and that really helped our teams. I would say that this should be a kind of very important pattern should be considered, I think, as far as team norms. See, the thing is that uh, you need to have the feedback. In order, if something is not working, you need to have the feedback, and feedback happens through the retro retro retrospective. If your retrospective was too far away, then that feedback will be gone. So you should have smaller, smaller sprints. Fine? At least two weeks. I mean, at most at two weeks, I would say. If it is four weeks, then by the time you go to the retrospective, you forgotten, or, or I mean, there are other things which came into in, into the. So it is important that you have a mechanism or a forum where you can discuss these feedbacks, and that the feed retrospective is the one. Uh, and in order to make retrospective work, it should the spin cycle should be smaller. Any other questions?
thank you very much for joining the session thank you